Shalom. Shalom. This is my third time visiting the Anchor, and I'm so excited to be back. Um, my name is Robin, and I am a Jewish believer in Jesus. Um, I'm also an American Israeli, and I grew up in a traditional Jewish home, um, keeping kosher, practice, going to synagogue, practicing the Jewish law. And when I was in high school, so going out to the clubs, partying too much, destroying my life. And at some point, when I was rock bottom, my mom's friend, who was a Jewish believer in Jesus, started telling me about Jesus and the Messiah. And I said, if he's the Messiah, you can prove it from the Hebrew scriptures. And she would show me the prophecies, and I would fight with her. And she was so awesome. She never argued back. She'd always go, you've had enough for today. Bye-bye. See you tomorrow. <laughs> but she kept coming back. She was faithful. And I never told her, but I couldn't sleep at night thinking, who are these prophecies talking about? Because it sounds like Jesus, but I don't want it to be. One day she showed me Isaiah 53, a clear picture of the one who suffers and dies for our sins. I got furious thinking she was sneaking in the New Testament <laughs> when she showed me this clear picture of Jesus was in my Hebrew scriptures. I knew that Jesus was the one. I read the New Testament and I was shocked. This is such a Jewish book. I mean, it's for all of us, but my people think it's not for us. Peter, Paul, Mark, they're all Jewish. I knew three things when I was done reading the New Testament. This book is for my people. Jesus loves us more than anyone can love us. I wept through the Gospels. If you haven't read a Gospel from the beginning to the end, just straight through in a while, do it. Because you will re-fall in love with Jesus. And I knew I was called to Israel to tell my people, I found the one of whom Moses and the prophets spoke. This is Victoria. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having us. It's my first time here. Um, my name is Victoria, and I'm a Jewish believer. I'm also an Israeli. So I grew up in a completely secular family. No one believed in God. They still don't, not yet. We, no, no one spoke about God in my family, let alone Jesus. I always say that Jesus is the best kept secret in Israel, really. <laughs> there, there are military secret that are, secrets that are less secretive than Jesus. You know, it's just crazy, really. And so, you know, surprisingly, my parents sent me to a Jewish Orthodox religious school, but not because of God or, or anything like that, because, you know, those schools that are good schools, so they just wanted me to get the education, but kind of like keep their religious part aside. And, you know, I did because actually after going to this school, I did get to know about God, but I did get pushed away from God because of all the rules and regulations and the do's and the don'ts. Of course, you only know one part. You don't know about Jesus. That doesn't, there's, like, there's a lack of balance. So that actually pushed me away completely from the Lord, from God. I never knew Jesus, like I said, until at some point I completely stopped believing in God's existence. That was just too much, knowing that there is a God who's, who is a righteous judge and I'm a sinner. There's nothing I could do. So I completely stopped believing in his existence and I just lived my life as a completely secular person. And at the age of 18, I got recruited to the military. It's mandatory in Israel where I live. Um, it's about two years for girls, three years for boys. Now it kind of changed a little. And so I got recruited to the navies, just like some of you are. And um, my unit was really hard. It was really tough, rough unit. We, I had one of the longest trainings courses and we just saw courses coming and going. And we were always look at them and just saying how they get to go, they get to finish and we're stuck here. I served with guys, I served with boys. That means that the physical part of things was also more tedious and more difficult. And, and that was just hard, the treatment. They, one thing about the navies in Israel is that they're really big on discipline. Military is big on discipline, you know that, but in the navies, it's just, they go at you, they go at you, they will, if necessary, they can humiliate you, they will just do everything as possible to kind of conform you to this soldier that they need you to be, because I served in communications and we did some secretive things, I can tell you, because then I have to go, come and get you, <laughs> but um, for your sake, I'll just say that um, it's just some stuff that you need that discipline. And I started, and, and, and emotionally, physically, I couldn't take it. There was no one I believed in. There was no one I, 
I, I could have held on to. And I got myself really searching for the truth. And, I, and that's how I got into New Age and super dark spiritual things. And my health started to decline really drastically, really, really, really fast. My emotional state started to decline really fast. It was depression, anxiety, crazy things. And it got really dark and every and, and so many levels. And really right then when I really thought there was not going to be any light in the end of the tunnel and I was just about to do something super drastic, Jesus somehow through someone miraculously entered into my life, revealed himself to me and changed my life upside down. And here I am today. So we both work for Chosen People Ministries, and we're both based in Israel. And Chosen People Ministries' whole goal is to bring the gospel to the Jewish people, to show them how much God loves them. Um, we say bringing the message back to the original messengers. Um, and we do that in all different ways. Like in New York, in Brooklyn, most of the Jewish community are Orthodox, very religious, and very poor. Across the bridge in Manhattan, most of the Jewish people are quite secular and business professionals. So the type of events and ministry we would do would be different. So the same is true in Israel. We both work out of our Tel Aviv Messianic Center. Imagine a community center. We have Bible studies, we have worship nights, but we have art classes. We have English as a second language. We have coffee houses. We have Friday night dinner, Shabbat dinners. So we do all sorts of things a community center would do, but all of it with a faith base, all of it with a testimony, all of it creating a safe space for people who don't know Jesus to come in, to hear about him, to ask their questions. Um, so we're working in Israel, and the ministry center has been thriving. Our capacity is exactly, you know how the safety inspector sticks a number on the wall? Mm -hmm. Our capacity is 87, and our large events have 120 to 130 people. Oh, right. You know, there's an expression in English that says, if you build it, they'll come. Yes. And we keep saying, they're coming, so we better build it. <laughs> we are in the process of building a bigger center, by God's grace. Yes, amen. Um, and we're really excited for it to be complete. So we can um, do bigger outreach. But for now, our, our center is thriving. And non-believers are coming in and asking questions. And it's just amazing. But then, October 7th yes. happened. Yeah, so I'll share with you a little bit about October 7th. It's still really crazy to talk about that. Because you know how you went to trauma, but it's not over yet. So you're not done processing. So for, for me, for us, it's, it's really raw. It's, it's really hard to talk about that, but uh, I do want to share with you. So it was that Saturday that we call that Black Saturday, the most horrific event that the Jewish people experienced since the Holocaust by far. We were not prepared for it by any means. You know, our military is amazing. We so, by God's grace, we're so strong, we're prepared. We have crazy things happening in the military, but we were not prepared for that. And the first ones who experienced those atrocities were the young adults at the Nova party. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that those, those were young adults, those were kids that came from all over the country to that party. It was just huge, famous party that a lot of people were coming to, to participate, staying for a few nights, paying a lot of money to be part of this party. And then it happened and it was a very crazy slaughter because what, the, what Hamas did, they sent rockets. So what happens when you have rockets, you distract it on those rockets and you run away to the shelters. But what actually happened that those rockets were just a distraction as the terrorists were coming inside for the first time in our history, <coughs> inside our country, with their weapons, with their, with, with their tanks, to completely slaughter and, and abuse them. Since there's kids, I'm not going to use specific words, but take your imagination, let it be wild, and then add some more to it. And, and then even more. Any scary thing you can imagine happened there. There was just nonstop shooting. The, we, we say in Hebrew sometimes between each other, we say the ground became red. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so this is what happened. People were, were getting into the cars to drive to safety to try to get away. They were driving for 25 minutes. Imagine you're driving for 25 minutes. You hear those shootings behind you. And then you're just to reach to the, a car with terrorists. That come, to, that come to the car, shoot the guy, take the girl, put her in the van, shoot her in her hand, 
bow, bow her with her head until she comes to Gaza, <coughs> either to the tunnels or either to the to the to the houses where they were hostage, where they kept the women, especially hostages. Men who just went straight up to tunnels, um, obviously when there's no no daylight, almost no food, no water, and so um, our military call up was very very quick. You know, usually what happens after we finish our mandatory service, we get one year off. One year when we can start building our lives, get into college, get into school, get into job. And, but they give you one year. And what happened this year is that they just called them immediately. Some of my friends were just released um, and they were called back after a few days. A lot of our guys were just abroad, you know, um, just doing stuff, uh, going on vacation, seeing family, building their lives, getting enrolled in schools. And they just got the phone call. And the thing is that everyone wanted to come back. No one was like, oh, I wish I could stay longer on my vacation. Elal sent those um, airplanes when people where people just sat on the floors and was just waiting to come back. Imagine like your mom, your dad, your children, they're getting slaughtered. You want to be back and fight for them. And so our country got so, so united. And part of, the, of this unity um, was very evident in, th in the fact that First of all, it was mostly the civilians that helped that helped other civilians, and they were giving supplies to one another. Um, for instance, one of my friends he got recruited to the military. It was just one phone call that you know it's gonna it's gonna come to you. So he just packed a little bag, like a small backpack, and he went. Of course, he didn't have anything with him, not much things. And he got there, and those soldiers they. A lot of them sleep on sleeping bags outside because there's no room inside. Imagine that's the first time that almost everyone, as much as possible, were called up, especially in the beginning, because you don't know how much uh, manpower you need. And so they came there and they didn't have, they didn't have pillow, they didn't have, of course, pillowcases, they didn't have mattresses. The, at, the, at the beginning, they didn't have enough food. So what happens is that what happened was that civilians took out the credit cards and they spent thousands on each other. My friend just got the, to his base and he saw how his fellow um, um, soldiers lived and he said, just let me go. And he, as he was, he did a big purchase and he said, you know, as I was, as I took out my credit card to pay for it, I was about to pay. I see a hand kind of taking my, my hand down. That was just another, just a civilian. And he said, let me, let me cover it and tell me what else you need. So those were the civilians that we just helped each other. And also in those villages, you know, it took about, the military took about seven hours to come and sort the things. But so those were the, the, the citizens, the civilians that took their own guns, that took their own supplies and were protecting one another. And, and so what happens after we, we've been so divided, you know, we had a big division and our country was polarized. What happened on 7 of, Oct of October, people risked their own lives for each other. And even in the party, it really fascinates me how just young adults were saying, you know what, let's just, let's stop our car, let's park here, let's go back and see if we can help someone and someone was injured. injured. People were risking just their lives for one another. We also have a lot of displaced people, both from the north and from the south. And that's really hard because their husbands or their kids or their uh, boyfriends, fiancés, they're recruited. And so a lot of them are just living like refugees in their own country, just, you know, in different hotels. And it's, it's, it's really hard. Of course, um, we had a lot of mi lots of military losses, and it's it's just awful, you know, that knock on the door that every mom is frightened of, that they just gonna come and tell you that your husband, your son, they're gone. And a lot of moms, some of my mom's friends, they their husbands are recruited and their sons are recruited, and the thing is that we don't hear from them for days, especially when they go in inside you know the more the higher the rank is the craziest things you do right you, they can't they can't hear from you and we also had a few believers that that died in the war protecting protecting our lives and so our losses are are really really great but you know it also changed a few things in our society and a lot of people are are open a lot of people are open <coughs> just for the gospel for anything spiritual you see a lot of people especially the young adults that, be, that have been in the Nova Party and been interviewed, they, they became religious. Mm -hmm. Because like I said, you remember I said Jesus is the biggest secret? Mm -hmm. It's not just easy to be like, oh, you know, I'll just be a believer in Jesus. People don't know about Jesus. People don't know what, what he has done for us. People don't know he was Jewish and people don't know that the Old Testament is such a Jewish book. So a lot of people became religious and they started to believe in God and they started to seek and there is such a huge openness and especially in the ministries that we do, you know that even believers can be on the fence, right? And even believers can profess the Lord but not necessarily walk with Him. But since 
But since the, the, the events happen, we have believers, um, believers and non-believers coming to our events and just being on, on just being so hungry to know about God, so hungry to to they just want to devour God's word, they just want to get to know him, they just want something that will hold them at this time because it's just impossible to to even fathom and, and the war is not over. I'm asking my friends that are in military and I'm and I'm asking them, is this gonna be over yet? Do you think there's gonna happen something in the north? And they just say they try to calm me down and they say, yeah, I think there will be. But don't worry, we just we want to do it well. We started something and we want to do it well. I spoke with one of my friends today and he's in this like really, really crazy, you know, elite kind of unit. You know, they did crazy things that maybe some of you did or maybe some of the people that you know did. <coughs> he told, he said today to, he knows I'm speaking in a military place today. And he said, tell them that we're on fire and that we're going to win this. And that, and that we're just gonna finish what we started. So this is this is their attitude. Even they keep losing people. We have great hope though, because we have scriptures that tell us that God made promises to Israel. In Amos, it said that God was gonna bring us back into the land of Israel. You know, we were always there for thousands of years, and there's always been a remnant. God keeps a remnant, but many of us returned in 1948. And it says when he brings us back in Amos that it's never to be put out again. And in the scriptures it says, can a nation, can a country be born in a day? And yet God did it. He birthed a nation in a day. So we have so many promises throughout the scripture. You know, a lot of the media, social media today says, like, we just showed up in 1948. People send me things saying, why did you guys come and take someone's land in 1948? Anytime we do an archaeological dig, we find what? Hebrew scriptures. We find what? Synagogues that Jesus was in 2,000 years ago and older. So there's so much proof um, of all that God's word says. And so we can trust, because we see the history, we can trust forward that God has a plan and he's with us in the midst of this most difficult time. So on October 6th, I had a friend who was getting married on October 10th and her wedding guests were in the country. And I took her mom and some of the guests out for dinner on October 6th to a neighborhood that was half Muslim and half Jewish, and we ate a meal together, and there was a sense of peace. Usually when a war's coming, you feel the tension, right? Now with Hezbollah, we feel it. There's little things back and forth. There was no back and forth. It was a really peaceful, quiet time in Israel. We came back to my house. We went to bed, and 6.20 in the morning, we heard the sirens to go into our safe rooms because the rockets were coming in. I was pounding on their door, wake up, wake up. There are rockets coming. You have to come into the safe room. And, you know, they were from England. They were like, what? Rockets? Safe room? What are you talking about? I'm like, come with me. I'll explain it in the safe room. And we soon learned that that was all a cover so that everyone would be distracted by the rockets and terrorists could break into the country. Um, the impact on families, Victoria touched on it a bit, is huge because everyone knows someone who was affected that day. I have a friend, he lived on a kibbutz in the south, and he was part of their security council. And he and six other men went out to keep Hamas from coming into their kibbutz. They fought back Hamas, and their entire kibbutz was saved. But two of them, my friend and one other, were killed fighting off Hamas. Oh, thank you. All of us know someone. All of us um, are impacted by it. And the ongoing struggle of knowing that there are hostages in um, Gaza is just so much in our reality. So our ministry had a shift, right? What was that code, uh, Pastor Levi, that you gave me for when you have to change things in the military, be ready for anything? Well, that is our life in Israel. So here we were doing ministry. We were planning very festive events and gatherings to share the gospel. And suddenly, our entire center became a supply house. 
We had food that we had to get out to elderly Holocaust survivors afraid to walk outside because the siren would ring and they couldn't run home in a minute and a half to shelter. Um, many people who were afraid to go out needed food, displaced from their areas, needed food. And also the military, the military had never called up that many people that quickly. They eventually caught up. We do have a great military. But initially, they literally called people. El Al just made an ad, a uh, commercial, and El Al is our airline. And they literally sent planes to pick people up after the Army, Israelis traditional take this year off and go traveling. And they sent planes to South America, to New Zealand, to pick up the guys and girls, women, who had gone out to travel after their military service, they brought them back even without seats in the plane, sitting on the floor of the plane. And they brought them all back to serve. And in this commercial, it's a commercial for when the war is over. So it shows that they go and they pick up the guys and the women and they come home, they drop their backpack, they put on their uniform, they hug their parents, they go straight into Gaza to fight. And then the war's over, they go home, they hug their parents, they pick up their backpack and they go back out to adventure. Um, we're not there yet, but we're hopeful. But that's really what happened. So soldiers who left thinking they had a year off and their shoes were worn out or their boots had holes didn't have time to get new boots. They didn't have time to pick up. The, you know, the military supplies some things, but some things you're expected to buy. Thermals. It's really cold at night in the desert. Um, headlamps. So we just became a supply house buying everything we could to help the military and to help the civilians, our ministry had to shift. And then we noticed another shift. At some point in time, the military caught up. Everybody had the supplies they needed. But now people were coming out of their house. But like literally, I met a woman. I walked out of my house and there was a young woman in her 20s just standing like this. It's like, are you okay? She said, this is the first time I left my house since the war and I'm scared. Will you walk with me? And so many people we realized needed emotional and spiritual support. So we started doing small group Bible studies, trauma care sessions, having experts come in and talk about how to avoid PTSD, how, what questions to ask, how to encourage each other, how to walk together through this, um, and just meeting those kind of needs. And we have non-believers coming. And they're so hungry. Someone read a portion of scripture and started to teach on it. And it's the person who doesn't know the Lord and doesn't know the scripture that's like, wait, wait, wait. Can we read the whole chapter? You know what? Can we read the whole book before we do this study? They're so hungry. And many people who never read scripture are writing in uh, chat groups. You know, I'm finding peace in the Psalms. And I can't believe I'm saying this, but I read the Psalms every night. And that's what's giving me strength. Um, the Lord is faithful. I was on a backpacker trip, reaching out to people after the army, sharing about Jesus with them some years ago. And I had a team with me. And one of the guys on the team was just after his military service. And I was at a dinner and I said that I was a Jewish believer in Jesus. And this guy comes running across the room and he's like, did you just say you're a Jewish believer in Jesus? I just heard that for the first time. And I went to a Bible study and I'm fascinated. You have to tell me how you came to believe in Jesus. And he just asked question after question. He was so hungry. But then when we got back to Israel, he fell in love with a woman who wasn't open to spiritual things. So every time he sees me, he's like, oh, I still think about that Bible study, but oh, not that ready. Well, he sent me a picture a few weeks ago. He sent up to the Golan on the border preparing for the war in the north. And he's, guess who's in his group? The other believer who was on the backpacker trip. He sends me a picture, we're together, and we're talking about the Bible. God is faithful. Yeah, praise God. And, and pray for the believers in the army because they have an opportunity like never before. People really want to know, where is God? And some start angry, but some are like, I need God. But either way, asking where is God is the beginning of a great journey. Um, the impact on families, I have a friend. She works from home, 
and her husband, in, in Israel, you have to serve reserve duty until you're 40, if you're a man, for one month. Yeah, your job has to hold your job, and for one month every year, you have to serve reserve duty, um, but it stops at 40. Well, I have a friend, and her husband is 50, and he's never stopped. He's a medic in combat. And he's the guy in Gaza, when one of our guys gets shot, he has to run in and get that guy through the bullets and bring him somewhere safe to try and put him back together. And so her husband's in serving. Her son is 19. Guess where he is? Combat in Gaza. Her daughter just turned 18. Guess where she's going this month? She's going to the West Bank as a border patrol, which is a very dangerous job in Israel. So every family is like this. You know, imagine how we're functioning as a society, too. People are all called up. There's no one to work the farms. There's no one to run some of the businesses. It impacts the whole of um, the country. And there's one thing we know, too, that the world, you know, the world thinks it's all about who lives here and who lives there and where is the line in the sand. But we all know it's a spiritual war. Hamas calls it a jihad, a holy war. And we all know that it's something that's going on in the spiritual world. So it needs a lot of um, prayer. I'm going to let, uh, want to talk a little bit more about the hostages. So I'm going to let Vika share. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I just want to share with you a little bit about the situation, of especially the women and the hostages, because women are, you know, I'm a woman. It really speaks, uh, hits close to home. And then I want to share a cool story with you, too. So the situation with the women in the, in the tunnel, most of them are in the tunnels. Some of them get to go to the house of their kidnappers, let's call them this way. And, but others, most of them are in the tunnels. And tunnels are just a really a disgusting place, i got to tell you, like from the things that my... my the men go in the tunnels. We don't have like any fighter women, the women that go in the tunnels. So from what my friend said, it's really awful in there. There's no light, there's no water, there's no fresh air. Sometimes they get uh, food, sometimes they don't. But um, they get, you know, so much abuse from Hamas. And they, they, they put a gun to their head, tell them, take your clothes off, go to take a shower. But guess what happens in the shower? And guess how many times a day? And guess how, how, how violent. We got, a, we got a picture of this woman. And, and one of my friends, she just showed that to me too. And it kind of was just hard to see that. You see their, their, their faces ripped off. You see their bodies are ripped off. And that's from that, whatever was happening in the showers. And that's the reality all day long. We, we, get, we got some reports that some of them are pregnant. Just imagine their lives there. And the most difficult thing that they hear day by day is that the terrorist Hamas comes to them and, and they, tell them, they tell them, you know, you're never going to go home. This is your reality. This is what's going to happen until you die. Your country, Israel, forgot about you. What do you think? They're here to kill you. They, they, they're here to, because, you know, we, 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 we tell the people to evacuate before we shoot a rocket and when we come in. So, of course, you have all those bombs also from our, from our side against the terrorists. And, the ter and those Hamas, tells, they tell these women, this, they come to get you, they come to kill you too. They don't care about you. You're going to die here. And we have babies there. We have little kids there. And this is what... And, and some of the women... Have you heard the story of Mia Shem? She's one of the. She's in. She's in the states right now, and she got out. Of, she got out of there, and she said that the girls tell, told her, "Please don't forget us. Please tell the government. Please fight for us. Please get us out of here. They want to leave. This is the reality." But I do want to share a really short but cool story with you about uh, this. Uh, she's my hero. She's really my hero. I always share her story. Her name is Rachel, and she's from this city called Ofakim, which is close to Gaza. She's an more an older lady. She's like sixty something, a mama. You know, we all don't know those mamas. And so um, she was in, in, in her home with her husband, and there come five terrorists with weapons, kalachnik, you know, grenades. They come inside, and they just break the door, and she, she stands in front of them, and she says, are you hungry? You look hungry. You look like you had a, you, you look like you had a busy day. Let me cook something for you. So she, sit, she, she places them in her couch, and her kitchen is just right behind, and she starts to cook for them and sing songs for them and speak with them in Arabic because she's from a Middle East background. Long story short, she held them on hold for 20 hours until the military broke inside. 
And they somehow created this relationship between them that when the military came inside, the terrorists didn't shoot her and her husband. They just ran upstairs while were trying to fight for their lives. And, she, and she's alive today. She's completely, she's fine and well, and you can find her online. And she is a hero because imagine, you, you get that, you, you, your door is broken and those are terrorists. Do you want to feed them? But um, yeah, she's, she's, she's our hero. She's definitely. Are you going to share your other story? And yeah. There is uh, one story I want to share with you. From It's a true story from a friend, and I'll mute it. Jewish students are afraid to go to university in America. There are marches on campus. There are people breaking into the libraries and trying to attack Jewish students. Um, it's global, and in multiple countries, Jewish people have been attacked or killed in the last months. Um, and we, we know that they are the apple of God's eye. God has a special plan, and not because they're better. The scriptures say, nope, we're not better. We're stiff-necked. <laughs> but God chose this very small, I mean, it's real so tiny, this very small nation and this very small group of people to show his glory and his faithfulness. And that's something that's for all of you, too, all of us, because he is faithful to the Jewish people. We know, and we see it. We have the proof. He brought us back into Israel. We, we have the proof of so many things he said he would do and he's doing. We have the promises that we're saved in Jesus, that he loves us and he grafted those who aren't Jewish into the promise and we have eternal life. And we can trust that because we have a history of a faithful God. So please stand with Israel at this time um, and pray with us. And we have more we could say, but I want to make sure we leave time if there are questions. So I think first we'll open it up if there are any specific questions. And if not, we'll just share a little bit more. You can ask questions about our ministry, about the war, about the military, um, whatever you would like. So who's funding your ministry? Um, so it, it, we're support-raised ministry each um missionary or staff raises their own support. And how do you get it or advertise or how do people afford it now? Um, online, we speak in churches, all different ways. Yep. Uh, uh, there's, if anyone does want to get prayer updates or support, we gave out brochures and you can rip off the rip out slip in there and sign up for our prayer letters. Half of them are Victoria's, half of them are mine. Sign up for one, both, either, neither. <laughs> But if you want to get prayer updates, plus you'll get these news, um, monthly news updates that actually teach you about the holidays and how they relate, like, you know, Passover is coming up. And so much about Passover is really also telling us it's about that time and how God redeemed the people unto himself. But it's also telling us how he would redeem us unto himself through the blood of the lamb. So there's so many parallels. So I would sign up for that. Any other questions? How many Israeli hostages are there? So there were originally 256. 56. And now there's 134. We do not know how many are actually alive. Um, we know for sure about 30-something are confirmed dead. There are others they have said are dead, but they told us someone else was dead who then came back very much alive. So we think some of it's psychological torture. So unless it's confirmed, we're assuming people are alive. They, um, the, the people who we got back saw some of the other hostages. They were moving them around a lot. So they saw some of the other hostages. There's a story of one little boy. We have all the children back except two. A little baby, Kfir, who's one year old, and his brother, Ariel, who's four or five now. Um... One of the young boys who was held hostage, um, another boy got sent into where he was being held who hadn't been with him before. And, you know, they're in all different settings. Some of them have no contact to anything outside. Others, the, the, the um, terrorists keeping them are watching the news so they can pick up some of the news. So when he came into the kind of jail gated area with the other boy, he said, hey, is your name so-and-so? And the little boy said, yes, how do you know? He said, oh, he said, happy birthday. And he goes, how would you know it was my birthday? And he said, I saw it on the news that it was your birthday. And the little boy said it was the first time he had any hope because they are telling them, no one's looking for you. 
No one's coming for you. They're going to bomb you when they bomb us. And so that was the first time he knew, no, they are looking. I'm on the news. They're looking for me. They know it's my birthday. Uh, quick question. Um, what type of support is Israel getting? Uh, I understand um, I understand that uh, at least here in America, um, Israel is not liked too much. Um, a lot of protests about Palestine and Gaza and everything like that. Uh, obviously, I, I know what war looks like, and uh, I, I understand where you guys are coming from, but what type of support are you guys getting from either the Western or anywhere else in the world? Um, it's, it's kind of a mixed bag, because in one way, the U.S. has been one of our closest allies in this, right? And you guys have stood with us overall. But occasionally, at the same time that President Biden's like, we're with you, we got your back, he's like, hey, Netanyahu, finish this quick. You know, and Netanyahu's like, we can't finish it quick. You can't play it, you guys know. You don't play at war. You don't kill three quarters of the guys in a war and then say, let's leave the other quarter and its leader alive. Mm -hmm. They're going to replicate in a minute. And that's what Netanyahu just said. He said, listen, we have to finish Hamas. Because if we don't get rid of all of Hamas, then everything we did was for nothing. Because they're just going to rebuild immediately. You don't play at war. So we're getting support from some European countries. We're getting support, you know, the government. We're getting support from the U.S., but it's also always with a little bit of, can we try to control this, yeah. you know? So I, I, I hope that our government will stay strong and not care about public opinion and do the right thing to keep us safe. Hamas keeps saying that was a practice. This can be October 7th and 8th and 9th and 10th. I would take them seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we know that we gave work visas to 20,000 Gazans to work in Israel. Many of them worked on those kibbutzes. We know that the kibbutzes where the Gazans worked had the most deaths. Mm -hmm. On one of them, the security guy killed the terrorist who had the list on him. And in the list was this security guy's name. Mm. And it said, this man is the security guy. Kill him first. Then kill his wife and kill his three kids. And it listed the kid's name. Then go across to this address and kill his brother in law. And I had a whole kill list with all the details how to get in, how to do things, what their lives. The kibbutzes where they didn't have Gazans working had less. So, you know, we know that this was planned for two years. We have to take seriously their threats. We cannot pretend that we can live next door to Hamas. Now, notice I'm not saying Palestinians, I'm saying Hamas. We are, we're, uh, uh, I don't know another military, and maybe I'm wrong, and you guys can correct me, that actually says, we're coming here tomorrow and hitting here, like gives away all their secrets. We're hitting here tomorrow, so we'd like all the civilians to leave and go there, and we're gonna drop food there. <laughs> And then we're going to come here and get the terrorists. Obviously, some of the terrorists can sneak away with that. But that is actually what they've been doing through the whole time. They have been searching buildings. We're, we're losing our friends because they are going into the building before they to make sure there aren't civilians left behind. And they are rescuing. They found a grandma who was left behind in a wheelchair. I guess the family couldn't push the wheelchair or maybe something happened to them. Um, they found some children who were left wandering. And they always get them to safety. Um, we are trying very hard not to hurt civilians. The media is so skewed. It said, today they said that we uh, shot at people trying to get aid. It's like, why would we let the aid trucks in if we were going to shoot the people? We're bringing in the aid trucks. We're, we're trying to protect them. <coughs> Hamas is shooting at them. Hamas really wants a high civilian number. Also, Hamas mm -hmm. controls the health agency. So they control the numbers. So you see these numbers come out, and they claim they're all civilians. We know we killed at least 13,000 Hamas militants. They don't, they say zero. We, they call us all soldiers, so they're allowed to kill us, even a baby. They said even a one-year-old baby is a soldier. And they uh, say they're all civilians. So it's very unjust. We're, the media war we lose. The media war we, war we lose no matter what we do. And you do see these big marches, and it's horrible. The people, they meet, some people are just against us. But many people, especially college students, they're just joining in. They do not know they mean well. They think, oh, I see someone getting hurt. 
I'm going to go and protest, but they don't know the facts. Mm. They don't know the history. You see these interviews. Do you know from what river to what sea you want people, you know, you're chanting that uh, Palestine will be free? It means all of Israel. They don't want to share, they, you know, Hamas, they don't want, they want it all. They want to kill all the Jews. You're actually chanting for the death of all Jews. Do you realize you're chanting that? And some do, and some don't. So it's... Uh, I have a lot of Arabic friends that would definitely chant that. Um, but, yeah, I, uh, I, I know what our media shows, uh, and I don't really pay attention to it too much. But it's good to have you guys to have your aspects from it, or your actual personal views from it. So, um, you know, thank you for that. Our main support is from the believers. Stick with us. Stick with the Bible. Stick with... <laughs> yeah. um, can you actually share how the negotiations are going for with the release of the rest of the hostages? One. And do the people feel that Netanyahu is doing what the majority want him to do, you know, from a political standpoint, and really wanting to wipe out Hamas, get the job done, because you hear, you know, Biden, whoever, say, no, no, we just got to have peace, we got to just end this thing, and so there's this, obviously, um, disagreement there, and that could prolong things, um, and that's kind of one thing, and I've got another question. Yeah, okay. So your, the first question was, how does the negotiation go? Yeah, how is it going now to release the rest of them? Do you see a time frame that it can actually be met? Or is this going to be something that is going to continue in the war and just, you know, it's not going to happen? Well, our first priority is to release the hostages. It's definitely a priority. It's just sometimes they, they ask the, um, we're being pushed to release the hostages if there's going to be a ceasefire. But the thing is, Bibi really, Bibi and the military, they want to finish what they started, too. So we have that conflict of releasing the hostages. On the other hand, we want to finish what we started because there are going to be more hostages. Or the same hostages might go back to it. So according to what I follow in the news and, and the information that I receive from the people that I know is that it kind of changes all the time. Bibi is really, really pressured to release the hostages, but you see he had, um, authorized the, um, the operation in Rafiah yesterday. So he wants to proceed with it. And honestly, I think he's going to go forward. He's going to proceed with it. But there's going to be pressure. And he keeps saying, you know, we have all those countries standing with us. But even if I have to stand alone, I will. And so it's just this tension. And we're just going to see what happens in Ramadan right now. How things are going to change. So each day, just stay tuned because each day you have something new, new happening. If, if, you follow, yeah, if you follow the news. It's Ramadan right now, yeah. so for a whole month, right? And that was another thing. You know, people claim that Israel is an apartheid and committing a genocide. Well, if you're apartheid and committing a genocide, you let 40, 45,000 Muslims go to pray. Not only is it their holy place, but it's our most holy place. And yet 45,000 Muslims are playing, praying there every day since Ramadan started with Israeli security protecting them. So, you know, the, the, the media just so skews things. The only one who commits an apartheid and is promising a genocide is Hamas and Hezbollah. Hamas says we want to kill all the Jews. Genocide. Every territory we gave back in land for peace during the trading, you know, in, in uh, the 90s and early 2000s, we gave land for peace. Every place we gave for peace, they put up a sign that Israelis can only enter at threat of death. That's apartheid. <laughs> so the news has it really all upside down. The Palestinians who actually live in the areas of Israel controlled by the Israeli government have more freedom and more rights than the Palestinians that live under Hamas um, or even Abbas in the West Bank. Um, they have so much more freedom and so much better quality of life. Um, so it's really just completely, very sadly skewed. You had one other part to that question. I don't know if you should really I answer. It's kind of military type thing, but I understand the rockets that were sent in were deterrent, you know, October 6th, and, um, and then the ground forces of Hamas came right through. How did they breach the IR, you know, the uh, IDR so easily that has technology that would know you know, that something is building there and how would they be able to get in through those borders through forces to be able to get 
and do what they do. The more, you, the more we invest, investigate, the more information that we have. But you know, Hamas planned it for Hamas and Hezbollah planned it for years. So they know exactly what time people take a break. They know exactly what happens. So they flew over it in the time when people were not, were not in there or were sleeping or, or were changing shifts. So it wasn't that complicated. They planned it. And unfortunately, they had some, some, they say that they had some people collaborating with them. There was a bridge. So that's the unfortunate part. That's the most difficult part to say. There was someone that somehow infiltrated or is pretending to be with us and they helped them. They also took out, they took out the security cameras that they, they had researched the area. They had actually built inside Gaza kibbutzes like the ones on the other side and practiced. And we now know that there were some reports saying, hey, they're practicing these weird things. Um, but no one thought they had the capacity to do this. So in our country, right before the war, our country was just like here. You've experienced this here, the left and the right. Our country was divided. Half the country cheering on BB, half the country saying, pull them down now, call for re-elections. We don't want this government. And they were divided with each other. I can't talk to this side. Just like we had here. The minute the war started, we united completely. Doesn't mean people still have the same ideas. People say after the war, we have to deal with these issues. But for the war, this is a righteous war. We all know it's for our security. It's not people say revenge or no. It is for the survival of Israel. And we believe for the West, because if we let a terrorist group think they can do that, imagine what they'll do all over the world. You know, we have to be strong. Um, so everyone is very united. You might find some random, of, of course, in every country, a random person who says we, sh we, we need to stop. But most people believe we have to finish the war well. Um, it is very hard, the balance of win the war well and get the hostages back. And so that's a very, I, I would not want to be on the leadership team making these decisions. There was talk at least up till this morning, could have even changed by now, as Victoria said, things change quickly, um, that there might be a trade soon of the women. First they said women, children, and elderly. Then I saw women um, for between 700 and 1,000 prisoners. And 100 of them are um, life sentences. So, you, I mean, real bad terrorists, right? And that's Sinwar who started this. He was in prison and he needed surgery and Israel took care of him and did the surgery and got him well. And then he was released in a prisoner trade for a hostage. So you realize, I mean, imagine being the government that has to deal with this. We need our citizens back. We really care about life. We, I mean, it matters. And that's what, that's what, in the Muslim interviews, they always say that is their strength over us is that we care too much about life. We care about each other. No man left behind. We care about life. And they don't. They're raised and taught that they should be a martyr. To kill a Jew, it's worth to die. Will Israel govern Lebanon when Hezbollah is toppled? <laughs> so the question was, will Israel govern uh, Lebanon when Hezbollah is toppled? Um, that is not... That is not our goal. Actually, Lebanon is sadly a country that I've heard people say is like hijacked by Hezbollah. Hezbollah and Hamas, they're funded by Iran and they're terrible for wherever they're operating. They're not just terrible for Israel. Hamas abuses, kills, tortures Palestinians. Hezbollah doesn't care about the people of Lebanon. They all have a goal and an agenda. They're terrorist groups. So no, it's not our goal to lead uh, Lebanon. That is a completely its own country. <laughs> and hopefully uh, we can push back Hezbollah um, and not engage with something further with Lebanon itself. Um, did Hamas start in Israel or Palestine? And then my other question is, do you think you're going to get called back to military service anytime? or? Hamas started in Israel and Palestine. When you say Palestine, you mean Gaza? Uh, I guess so. <laughs> Sometimes people, it's so confusing, I know. So in, in there, um, 
It's it's. I'm thinking how to. I want to see if my mic is on. I'll turn off my mic for this. It's on. It's on. It's on. I'll turn it for just. No. Um. In 2005, Israel completely pulled out of Gaza. We were not occupying. Like I keep hearing people saying, "Well, what did you expect? You were occupying." Well, first of all, even if someone's occupying, they don't deserve what happened on October seventh. That's crazy. But we were not occupying. In two thousand and five, we pulled every last Jewish person who lived in Gaza, and Jewish people did live there. It it was, it's our land. It's part of Israel. Um, but we pulled them all out. We gave total rule to the Palestinian leaders at the time, which was Abbas. Mm-hmm. And so much money, billions of dollars, have been poured in. Cement's been sent to build schools and buildings. And all along, the newspapers would say, "Why don't you let cement in? Why don't you?" Now we know where it all went. It did go in. We did let it in. It was in the tunnels. Mm-hmm. Billions of dollars that just made Hamas leaders rich, and went to terror. All of it went to getting rockets in and building tunnels. But it has not been occupied. They had self-rule. And Hamas came in and started attacking Abbas and Abbas's guys, Fatah, another group, breaking their legs, killing them, scared them, and they ran away to the West Bank. And that's really how Hamas started to take over in Gaza and eventually got voted in because they were the strongest. But it was not occupied on October 6th. It has not been occupied since uh, since 2005. They could have built, everyone says like a Singapore. The amount of money that was given to build up Gaza and make it beautiful for the people and give them a hope and an education and a future is amazing. Um, but when you're led by a terrorist group that has one agenda, they you know, they even said it in an interview, or early in the war, one of the leaders of Hamas said in an interview, they said, well, why didn't, if you had all, built, have these tunnels, why don't you let the civilians go into the tunnels, and why don't you have food for them? You knew you were planning this two years. And they said, oh, everyone knows they're all just refugees. It's not our responsibility. Let the UN take care of them. They can't come in the tunnels. They're only for Hamas. So, you know, the, everyone, what they blame on Israel, it's really Hamas. Israel did everything to try and help them have a better future. Okay, so the question is, um, uh, it's a military-related question, but um, you know, we all know that we're living in the end days. Um, with that being said, we know that all the nations will rage against Israel, like we already see it. And um, a lot of believers are looking at um, the Gog Magog war and like, what is this looking like? You know, how is this going to unfold in the military? Um, is there intel about Russia? You know, and are, are, is the military prepared to deal with a battle against Russia? Um, is it something that you guys are already planning, you know, trading for, um, looking at, you know, um, you know, for a potential threat down the road? Because, um, you know, it's one of the signs that we look for in the end days, you know, if there's going to be conflict with that nation, you know, with Russia. Victoria knows, but if she tells you, she has to kill you. <laughs> I really think that some information is, um, it's really not, not to be discussed. There are so many levels that, you know, the, yeah. I think if I was Bibi, I would give you a nice political, politically correct answer, but I will tell you nothing just because we, the military is not Christian. They're not necessarily looking at the Bible or things like that. But regarding their other preparations, though, those will be like really for the higher ranks. I, I don't know. We are very aware that Iran is behind these groups, and we're aware that, you know, there are times Iran and Israel throw big bergs at each other, but both countries also know if that happens, it's on another level. So they throw words and then they back down. But of course, our eyes are open and we're aware. That's that's as much as I guess we would know on our level of clearance, except she probably knows more, but she's not going to tell you. <laughs> hey, so um, on, the, on October 8th, when we woke up here, I... Uh, I Probably like everybody here, I was filled with anger, revulsion, and qu- quite frankly, you know, just speaking for myself, I would have been quite all right if you had flattened the joint in that moment, gone full testament, you know, Old Testament on them. That said, um, does the church there struggle with anger right now, and how are you dealing with that? I mean, I, I can't imagine not being angry, not being fired up, and, you know, how are you dealing with that kind of anger and and, 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 and on a daily basis. Yeah, maybe we can both. Um, 
you know, it depends what what who you ask. But I think there's like an inner. Of course, we're angry. Of course, we're angry. Of course, we're disappointed. Of course, it's hard to trust again. And I, I think at the end of the day, kind of push. I, I can speak of like myself about myself as a, as a believer. Because I'm angry, I haven't processed a lot of things. When when this whole, everything is over, I think I'm gonna take just a few days, me and God, and just you know ask some questions and pray. I think it does pushes you to, because at the moment we don't have time to be angry. That's the thing. We don't have time. We don't have the, the emotional bandwidth to be angry, to let ourselves just be angry. So we just say, okay, what's, what's, we all become like soldiers, actually. We say, okay, okay, what's, what's, what's the best thing to do right now? Let's just push forward. And now everything, after everything's done, then I think we'll be very angry or, and, and just deal with everything again. And I'll get a moment that I get a little choked up or teared up, but I haven't had a big cry. And I talk to a lot of people who say the same, same thing. If we start to be angry or sad to the level that we need to be, we won't be able to function. I had a conference in um, the end of December in Europe, and I thought about not going, but we had Israelis coming too that needed to breathe and get away, and we had, you know, Jewish believers who needed to talk about the anti-Semitism on their campus. I'm one of the staff. I decided to go. And I went two days early to prepare a seminar. And for two days, I didn't have a heavy cry. I couldn't. I'm, I'm telling you, when I start to sob, it's going to be a reckoning. But I had silent tears that wouldn't stop going down my face for 48 hours. I had to call one of the other leaders of the conference and say, I can't do that seminar. I can't focus on anything outside of the war. So I said, instead, let's just do a panel discussion on believers' response to the war, have all the people represent different ministries or civilians who are helping get up and share, um, and we could just do it from our heart, from what's happening. Um, we're all angry. We all have a lot of questions for how things went that wrong that day. But we've all, as a nation, we've decided it has to wait till after the war. You can't focus and be divided. You can't win a war while you're struggling with the what's and the ifs. So, yeah, we're all very angry. And we're, I mean, I see people, we're so angry that there was so much hope that we could have lived side by side, that people could have been raised to be friends with their neighbors, and instead their whole education system was to hate us. Um, we're, we're angry for the Palestinian children. We're angry for us. Um, we, October 7th is one of those days life will never be the same. Many, many people I know are saying even, even some of our closest friends have come out as completely anti-Semitic. And the break of trust um, the realizing that you're considered other by people, um, we, we will never be the same. And I hope good comes from that too, because sometimes in your darkest pain and trying to understand it all, why, why us, why this, um, God can use it to bring a real revival too, where many, many, many people come to know him. So that's, that's my prayer and my hope. Is, and my, I hope my hope is bigger than my anger and my pain. But all of us know when, it, when the war ends, you're going to see an entire nation break down in anger and tears because we're, most of us are just trying to hold it together. In an unclassified manner, what is the latest news from Lebanon and uh, West Bank? I know that there's a t missile attacks from Lebanon, but what's, what's the status is it in an unclassified manner? Um, you know... A hundred rockets, that's a nice little barrage. Um, the last I heard was this morning. I haven't been on in the afternoon and things can shift quickly. But they, they continue from Hezbollah to send barrages of rockets. We have over 100,000 people displaced, can't live in their homes. And... You know, everyone's hoping that there can be some way to push back Hezbollah to a safe level without a full-out war. And one day it seems like there's no way we're not going to a war. The next day the rumors are Hezbollah really doesn't want to engage in war. Yesterday I saw Hezbollah say to Iran, 
um, don't worry, we'll go into this war alone. Like, we're not going to pull you into this war. Um, nobody knows for sure, but I think all of us feel, you know how I said at the beginning, we didn't feel it coming October 7th. We feel, we feel the war coming. We, we the West Bank operates differently. It's smaller clusters and lone wolves, but that can grow out of control too. Um, and Hamas has a lot of influence there. Um, we were really concerned that the West Bank and Jerusalem would go this first week of Ramadan. I mean, think about this. When it's Ramadan, so it's time to pray. And it's Friday. It's their holy day. These are the days we usually have the most violence. Um, so far, thankfully, it's been... But, you know, we, 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 we all are on guard um, that things could shift. And in Jerusalem, there is no wall or barrier. Um, I was, during the last time we were fighting with Hezbollah, I was walking on Road 1. It's one of the dividing roads in Jerusalem. And um, I was jumped by three Palestinian men hiding in bushes. I really believe it was the Lord who saved me from danger. I suddenly just called out every word I knew in Arabic, which is only like, you know, hello and thank you and good morning. <laughs> but it startled them enough to stop for a second. And in the distance, we saw a man. And, and the three men who jumped on me saw him and ran away into, across the street into the neighborhood um, where more Muslims are living. And all of a sudden that man was gone. And so many people I tell this story to are like, you had the visitation of an angel that day. Um, and again, I know so many Arabs and Muslims. We live side by side. My pharmacist is Arab and Muslim. Um, people who work in my local restaurants. I, we're not talking about Palestinians or all Muslims or all Arabs. We're talking about those who join the ideology of Hamas. Um, we're talking about squashing that, um, not people who want to live as good neighbors. And I just want to make that clear. Well, uh, we want to pray for them. And um, thank you for coming. So let's give them a hand. That's amazing. Um, you want to If people want to get our prayer letters, you can fill out the slip and bring it up here. Okay. Let me uh, pray for you guys. Lord God, I just uh, thank you for today. Thank you for all you're doing, Lord. I pray that you would uh, continue to bless this ministry. And Lord, thank you for allowing these um, young ladies to come and speak. And uh, Lord, we just pray that you would give them travel mercies, keep your hand upon them. And Lord, uh, we do pray for Israel and the peace of Israel and the Middle East. And Lord, we know that only true peace comes when you will rule and reign uh, as a king. Lord God, uh, keep them safe. And uh, just, Lord, we love you. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.